I know you're a very modest man, but do you ever allow yourself that moment to step back and say, wow, look what I've done? Tracy, I'll be completely honest with you. It's very hard for me to take complete pleasure in anything that I've made. You can love it and you can love it all, but you can always see things that could be improved. Uh, I wish I had the kind of person I could say, ah, oh, this is fantastic. But I don't think is that, in the art of music, I don't think there's any place for that kind of vanity. I don't know who else could, who could possibly feel that way, given the, the shoulders we stand on. But your shoulders are pretty broad and strong at this point. You're part of that foundation well, I now. couldn't get into the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Nostalgic Future Podcast, where the past is the only way forward. We're two guys in our 40s watching the world pass us by, and we know the only way we'll ever be relevant again is to somehow convince everyone to be as passionate as we are about our pop culture obsessions. We are your hosts, Joe Cook and Chris Marchand, and today is our cinematic rabbit hole, movie scores and the music of John Williams. Chris, we're here. This is part two of our series of our latest rabbit holes that we've been going down. Last week, I talked about my return to the movies, and yours is kind of movie related too. Uh, what rabbit hole have you been diving deep down these last weeks? Uh, mine, mine is a, 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 a very, very obscure composer named John Williams. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. He's uh, only put out a few little small pieces that, but you know, he's more of an obscure indie artist, John Williams. Is that right? About how do you, you, you have you heard of him? No, it doesn't ring a bell. Well, he's he's done a, a few smaller films called like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, and okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop the charade for now. So my rabbit hole starts with his music, but then where that's led me, which is finding all kinds of, uh, oh, I have a podcast I've been listening to, and all kinds of YouTube channels that devote their episodes to diving in deep into music scores and to different uh, movie soundtracks. And so, I mean, my favorites are John Williams. He is my favorite uh, living composer. Actually, you know, I have two living composers. That would be my favorite. But uh, as far as movies go, there is no other. Sorry, Hans Zimmer. But I'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, you know, I, I'm excited to hear, uh, you know, where where you've been going down this rabbit hole because you've been telling me about this for uh, a few weeks and I, I, I kind of, where's he going to go with this? You know, where? what about John Williams or are we going to find out? that you know what, what discoveries have chris made uh and you you sent me some links and i checked out the podcast and so i'm, I'm excited to talk about it you know what one thing i felt good about doing this as a rabbit hole is i would have done an episode on john williams anyway and i i, I might just say i mean maybe it took me a few years and i think i've talked about this before on the podcast but you know john williams is one of the larger influences in my life and I, I just can't even describe it, uh, that, that feeling when Jurassic Park just comes on. And that's, that's even one of the least ones for me. Like, I, I think what I said, maybe from my childhood, two key moments. I would say that I suffered from a lot of anxiety. My, my parents had a rough marriage when I was in uh, a lot of arguing, a lot of yelling in my household. Well, when I discovered Star Wars, it was it was my therapy. <laughs> it was the thing that that got me through. And so I was just obsessed with Star Wars. And I had this thing like, you know, you could maybe even call it like a psychological condition, but it was a way that I calmed myself down in the evenings. I would play the Star Wars theme song, the main song, the opening credits, the fanfare. I played that for myself every night as I went to sleep. That was me counting sheep. I could feel like I could calm down knowing that I've played the Star Wars song. It was a little bit OCD. It was a little bit obsessive compulsive. Like, you know, if I would have told somebody, you know, told a psychologist, they might've said, I don't know. I don't know if that's a healthy behavior. Looking back, I, you know, I, I eventually grew out of that. But like, so for me, when I think of John Williams, I think of comfort. I think of somebody who brought me so much beauty and comfort. Uh, the other thing is, is, I went and got the LPs at my local library. I've told this story before, I think. And I dubbed 
the original soundtrack of Star Wars episode four onto a tape, into a tape cassette. So I never bought the actual soundtrack, but I did dub it onto a tape and I still have that cassette and I play it in the car uh, for my kids every now and then just for fun. It's just, a, it's just fun to listen to it on tape that I recorded off of a record. <laughs> you know, this is from 19... 19- 91 or something like that it's just hilarious to me that i that that uh, i still have that and still works hopefully it'll work for a long time so in the midst of all this something happened a few months ago that really set me off on this rabbit trail and somebody shared a, a, a video of john williams conducting helena's theme from indiana jones 5 indiana jones 5 which is, which is coming out next summer and he does these performances uh, with an orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl. So somebody, you know, they have their bootleg version where they're filming it in concert. You know, thankfully, they didn't confiscate their phones. Uh, and so they're, they're putting up Helena's theme, which is um, Phoebe Waller's Bridge, I think is her name. She's an actress. She's going to be in the next the next Indiana Jones film. She's actually a great comedian and playwright. And uh, I love one of her shows called Fleabag. You ever seen Fleabag? It's this amazing British comedy show. You ever seen uh, that? I, I'm very familiar with it, but no, I've never actually watched it. It's on it's, uh, Amazon, right? Amazon Prime. Prime. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, comedy show. Pretty dark, pretty intense at times, but man, it's it's one that you just rewatch and it's, it's a kind of a masterpiece. But nonetheless, Williams debuted this piece and I just thought, oh, like every now and then I'm just reminded of John Williams and he's just amazing. So uh, the first thing, maybe the first place I'll take us down is I ended up buying a box set of CDs from him, which I'm holding up now. Here's my box set. You can see how thick it is here. You know, it was on sale pretty like almost like 50% off, if not more on Amazon. And I thought, well, there it is, right? You know, it comes with a nice booklet, which, you know, has a little bit of an introduction. That's nice. Yeah, it is a nice, it's a nice, nice release. And if you if you go through it, this is what's insane about it, is there's 20 CDs. There's wow. 20 CDs. And the packaging is pretty minimal, so it's just a cardboard slipcase. But there is more here than was that the, was that was that his Olympics music? Okay, so yes, yes. This one is a concert that he put on with all of the Olympic music, but it's not just his own. It's not just his own music. Uh, but it's amazing. Like this will actually get into one of the YouTube channels I've listened to, which they break down the hero's theme. What's it called? It's called Olympic Fanfare and Theme. He he composed it for the 1984 Summer Olympics, and it's just brilliant. Like it's so that this is on here. This is very like heroic kind of Olympic themed music. There are three. Count them three cds just of spielberg music right so if you want to get into your spielberg you've got that of course there's a star wars one maybe the only disappointment here is there there probably should have been another star wars one just because there's so much here but this is really as far as i can tell only the original trilogy is represented in this release so you know if you're wanting more then uh this this, this is going to limit you but uh anyway two more spielbergs Maybe the one thing that I'm disappointed in in when I got this is I didn't really fully understand what I was buying. This is as good as it gets, really, but most of these are performances when he was the conductor of the Boston Pops Orchestra. Okay, yeah. And so, like, if you want to hear the Indiana Jones theme, it's there, but it's not from the film. It's it's the Boston Pops version of it, which, I mean, most people can't tell the difference anyway. I can only mi minimally tell that, okay, this is not from the Star Wars films or anything like that. So if you're wanting like the, the actual recorded versions from the films, then that's not what this box set is. At the end of the day, I mean, what am I even whining about? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, no. you know, like it doesn't sound, there's, everything sounds pristine, but there's really too much here to even, even get into. Like there's other film music. So a lot of this is him conducting 
music from other films and the American songbook, like here's Gershwin, all, all this kind of stuff. It's just overwhelming, the amount of stuff in here. So that's that's my first little rabbit hole, which is just like immersing myself in his own music. There are a few pieces scattered about which are his own compositions, which I find kind of interesting. One aspect of John Williams that I wouldn't even know where to begin is, hey, the dude has composed his own works just as classical works, right? And no one knows anything about that, right? Like, like I, I couldn't tell you one of his own works. Well, there's a few of them in this, this release. So that's really nice. Oh, there's one CD where uh, he plays with Yo-Yo Ma. So Yo-Yo Ma is on one of them, right? It's just oh, a bunch cool. of stuff like that, right? So so that, that, that's that been a lot of fun. That's been a lot of fun. So that's, that's kind of part one of where I've been just delving into listening to John Williams. And I will say this, I will say this. I have noticed with younger people, I was not this type of person myself, but lots of people have this sentiment. They say this, I don't like classical music. And then you say, yeah, but you like film music, right? And you're like, you know, and they go, oh yeah, I love that. And so like my own sons, like I have a son who, because we love Star Wars, he will just play different Star Wars themes for himself as he's doing homework or as he's just doing other things. He will play the theme song for the Bad Batch or the Mandalorian or the Obi-Wan show, right? You know, there's, the, you know, Williams wrote the theme for the Obi-Wan show. He just loves playing the Star Wars themes for himself. Guess what? I owe that to John Williams. My son is not going to sit there and listen to classical music, but he is going to, he, he because of John Williams, he has at least some classical music in his life. So I'm just really grateful for the guy. Uh, you and I have talked about this type of thing before, which is like, we, we say this about Paul McCartney. We can say that we have been alive during history's, one of history's true great geniuses. You know, it's funny that you bring this up because I, I was thinking about this just yesterday that I am jealous of my wife because she's a couple years older than me and she got to be alive the same time as John Lennon. I was born you just a, 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 you know, a few, like three, three months after John Lennon right. was murdered and I never got to be on the earth at the same time as John. And I sometimes think <laughs> about that, but, but you were, that's so cool. Yeah, like, yeah you're so jealous of her. <laughs> so I, I hold on to the fact that Paul is still here and he's been in all these years. It means so much to me. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, I see where you're going here because yeah, I mean like, I mean, John Williams, he he is our Mozart, you know, he is yeah. he is our Beethoven. And, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I sent John Williams a fan letter. I got a he sent me a little five by seven autograph picture that I've got somewhere. But, yeah, I mean, oh, my gosh, that music like, uh, you know, it's funny. You mentioned Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was one that for me was huge I, I, that I did buy the album and played it over and over and over as a kid. Um uh, John Williams is just amazing. I, I I mean, and you forget just how much great music he's written for so many films. You know, we, we, you'll I'm sure you'll get to your the podcast that you've been listening to. I listened to an episode of it, and they they were just mentioning movies that I had forgotten were John Williams movies. I'd forgot John Williams did Home Alone. I had never known John Williams did the 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 um, score for JFK. Oh, okay, I forgot about that too. You know, a quick little pause about Home Alone. Like, there is like there are some people, and I I would kind of be one of them, to say that he actually saved Home Alone and made Home Alone. And it's really interesting to think about if you remove Williams's score from the Home Alone film. It's not that it, it wouldn't have worked, but there was I think they actually did another soundtrack. They like they tried another composer, and it was more of like that typical '80s kind of cheesy. I don't know how to put it almost like more pop oriented soundtrack with more guitar based and, and it just didn't work. And there's something about what he did to home alone, which you don't even realize what's happening to you. That's, that's, I think that's maybe perhaps part of the genius of what he does is he transforms a film and yet he is there partnering with the filmmaker. So it's not as if he's just, it's such a bizarre thing. Uh, he, so his ability to do that. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. Oh, Kevin, I'm so sorry.
like is almost a character in the film. It, yeah. it, it, yeah. it, it, and it because there's so much life to it. And I, I mean, <laughs> think about like anything he's written and just like listen to like a few notes and it completely transports you to whatever scene it was in. And it's like, you know, it, there's an image to his music that's just seared into our uh, psyche. And I, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, composers or songwriters or artists that I can say that about that have done it in quite the level that John Williams has in his what 90 plus years on this earth. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, 90 years, and, and it's incredible. Um, he has music coming out now for a film that I really want to see. So so here's what's funny. You talked about going to the movie theaters. I wish I could go to the movie theaters more. I would be the kind of person where I would buy one of those film passes so I could go at least once a week, if not twice a week, to the, to see a film. The problem is, is there's not a whole lot of films I like to see. <laughs> <laughs> like i don't really care for a lot of what comes out these days but there is a film that's coming to theaters that's that's it's already been released and it's slowly working its way out it's a steven spielberg film are you are you aware of the fablemans i, I am oh, just because i see the commercial 700 times a week on whatever streaming service and probably hulu i think has been playing that commercial a lot and it looks cool i mean it looks like classic spielberg looks like classic spielberg and the, and the, the funny thing is is people don't tend to go see movies like that anymore. We're only going to see movies with a Marvel thing attached at the end of it. And so this is an adult film, not that kind of adult film. <laughs> it's, it's a film made for people that are thoughtful, that have been through some life and want to see a drama. It's not playing in only the, the seediest of theaters and the yes. seediest of neighborhoods. <laughs> it's not one of those. Anyway, all of which is to say, Williams does the score for it. Now, where my rabbit hole leads us to is something that I have started to do in some ways, like over my lunch break. You know, I, I teach classes, and so I'm just making my lunch. I'll eat my lunch, and I have found this other avenue of YouTube of different musicians, composers that have YouTube channels that they devote themselves to unpacking and going in depth into how a song was written into the harmonic structure of the song, the, the music itself, going from why a certain chord progression like makes us feel something the way it does. And so the, the I have found both podcasts and uh, YouTube channels that just dive deep into this. And it's kind of endless. Once you start getting into these, into this rabbit hole, you're like, oh, well, I can watch this one and this one and this one. And it's just really kind of amazing. I, I think maybe what I would point out to is number one, YouTube channel, a composer and music teacher named Charles Cornell. Charles Cornell. He's on YouTube. You can, you can find his channel. And like, here's here's an example. The, uh, the title for one of the videos that I watched, one of the initial ones was, this 100-year-old music sounds exactly like Star Wars. He listed it there pretty cleverly. You're like, oh, well, what's he talking about? And you click on it and he goes into the the music of a composer named Gustav Holst, Gustav Holst, and he wrote an, an entire symphony, I think it's called a symphony, uh, called The Planets, where each movement is one of the planets. And this guy, uh, Charles Cornell, well, what he'll do is he'll he'll play the planets by Gustav Holst, and then he'll play part of Star Wars. And you're like, what? And we get these moments of just unbelievable similarities to the modern cinematic universe that we know. Like, check this out. Just crazy, but watch this. Check it out. It's the same chord, it's even in the same key. <laughs> This is one of those things that I can almost guarantee you that John Williams did very intentionally as, as a nod 
to clearly his greatest influence for this particular film. Right, it blows your mind, the similarities between this 20th century classical composition and how it inspired and how Williams, quite frankly, drew from it. Like, it's a direct kind of composition. You might say there's some plagiarism going on, which also is actually a big aspect of Williams and his style is, I wouldn't call him a plagiarizer, but uh, he is a popularizer of like different forms of music, like uh, a, a Richard Wagner, a Richard Wagner, <laughs> uh, Wagner, uh, the, 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 the German composer. Um, a lot of his stuff comes out of that type of style. Uh, by the way, you know, the, here, here's some things. This gets into, you know, music geek territory. Um, are you familiar with the term leitmotif? Yeah, I'm, I've heard of it. Yeah, so Williams is, he's the apex. He is the top of anybody who comes up with a light motif. It's why when I can go, da, 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 what, what did I just do there? Uh, the theme to Jurassic Park. Yeah, I literally, I literally just hummed three notes. Yeah. Right? What, is, what even is that? It's, it's some kind of magic that Williams was able to do so many themes or light motifs where Star Wars is maybe perhaps the best example because they're all character based. You have a force theme. You have a theme for Leia. You have a theme for Luke. Everybody gets their own light motif, which is a theme. And it's the hummable theme that we can associate with them. Oh, this will get into the, to the podcast that I was listening to. But when The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi came out, many people were analyzing the music to see if there were hidden messages within the music. So, for example, when Ray, when we didn't know who Ray's parents were, that they were listening to the music of those scenes that Ray was in with Luke to figure out if there were other themes from other Williams uh, scores from, from the soundtracks to figure out if there were hidden messages in the score that could tell us who Ray's parents were. Oh, and, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, I know what well, the thing I remember happening was when uh, Force Awakens came out, they released the soundtrack, the the titles of the pieces before the film, and people were dissecting the titles to try to figure out if there were any spoilers for the movie in it based yeah. on the, the, the titles to William's songs, which, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, that and that's interesting. And, and so, so there you go. So Charles Cornell as a YouTube channel. Then there's a podcast that I've really been listening to called The Art of the Score. The Art of the Score. And these are composers and conductors from Australia. And these guys are just great. And I mean, and if you love listening to Australians talk for, for two hours, which I do, I'm a big fan of the different accents of the world. Uh, these guys are just brilliant. And I think what's so amazing about what they do is how they unpack a score. And they have done tons of Williams' movies. They started out with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I've listened to a decent amount of their Star Wars episodes as well. And, oh boy, I just love how they go in depth about how the different themes run together. So I'll tell you, the ways that they can peel back the layers of how he may be composed and what elements he brings to his compositions. But then they also do these other amazing things. So here's one of the, the cool things they did with Star Wars was... They took Yoda's theme and they set it alongside uh, a theme from E.T. And they they found in the e in the E.T. score how there's a theme that's very very similar to Yoda's theme, and and it's just really kind of interesting. And then there's this other theory that in the Senate in in one of the prequel films, you, if you look really closely, there is an E.T. alien in the Senate. Do you know about this? Oh yeah, I, I I remember that very vividly. There's actually like I think there's like three ETs in there. So the ET like species or whatever, they're actually members of the Galactic Senate in canon. Uh, so I was working with Disney and we were discussing how we were going to do promotions for the orchestra's Star Wars shows. And we were going to film all this stuff in real life and then we we're going to drop in all of this Star Wars stuff. And they said, oh, no, no, we've got these rules that Star Wars is in the galaxy far, far away. It doesn't exist in our galaxy. Therefore, you can't put things into our world and mm -hmm. have them interact with other humans in our world. It's very specific. Now, this is a super normal thing it happens with doctor who mm. happens with all sorts of stuff where they're very specific about how you treat their characters and i said to them in a board meeting <laughs> with other men in suits oh no i said well actually <laughs> et 
is on Earth. Does, and yeah. I said, does everyone agree E.T. is on Earth? And they said, uh, yeah, I guess so. Looking at me like I'm a crazy man. Because keep in mind, these aren't film nerds. These yeah. are Disney yeah. executives in, yeah, in, in, in <laughs> yeah. licensing people. Yeah. And I said, well, so E.T. is on Earth. Mm. And E.T. turns up in um, the Senate of Episode 1. And therefore... E.T. <laughs> exists in our world, therefore exists in that world, therefore Star Wars exists in our world. Anyway, can we f film our thing? Yeah. I'm thinking I'm going to get a laugh to hear people are going to mm. know what I'm talking mm. about. It's going to be high fives all around. Just, you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> 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 Seriously, Dan. They They're like, Andrew, not... here's the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Play him off. <laughs> and that's where you had to turn to the riches of the podcasting world. Yeah, so so what I like what I love about what these guys do is they go into lots of different avenues of the movies themselves and then connect it back to the music. So they just do this in lo lots of different ways. All right, Chris, I'm so glad you touched on this because I I've only listened to one episode of, of this podcast. I chose the Jurassic Park episode because that soundtrack was so important to me as a kid. Now, I, I, I'm going to read you exactly what I have written in my notes. I After one episode, I thought that they should rename the podcast. And this, this is the new name I'm giving this podcast. Art of the Score. A detailed examination of how all John Williams scores sound exactly the same. <laughs> is that what they is that how they framed it their... okay well that's not at all what they said but as they're discussing jurassic park they're playing the different themes and inevitably during the conversation you know they go and if you listen to the soundtrack to you know raiders or whatever here's a, set, a theme that's on or an et there's a theme that sounds like this and they'll play them together and they did it throughout and at one point this is how i found out that he did the score for jfk they played I don't know what it was called, but uh, Dennis Nedry's theme from Jurassic Park, basically Newman's music. Okay. They're playing the music, and they're they're not actually playing on the piano. They're playing a little cut of it, and they um, spliced it together with a theme called The Conspirators from JFK, and it's the exact same music. I mean, identical. John Williams himself, believe it or not, um, just a few years earlier, he uh, scored to Oliver Stone's JFK. Um, some of the sort of the music for what they call the conspirators in that film uh, is really similar. And I think you guys, if you haven't heard this comparison, you're in for a shock. Check it out. Now JFK. Jurassic Park. I don't know what you're talking about, Nick. They sound nothing alike. And throughout the podcast, they they this sort of thing, this theme kept arising where they're looking at all of like these different little like connections between Williams, you know, work in one film and in another film and another film. And uh, one of the things that they kept saying was that basically Williams rips himself off a lot. Right, right. Well, so guess what? If you're like me and, you know, I have a music degrees and all that kind of stuff, if you love this kind of stuff, it's okay to go down this rabbit hole. If you want to maintain the illusion, you know, you you, you don't want this to be ruined. It's like, you know, ruining Santa Claus or something like that. Like, you know, like, please, if, if, if you don't want to go down this rabbit hole, this is the kind of one where you're like, yeah, maybe it's not for you. I love this kind of stuff. Like, I love hearing how it's all connected. They did this in an episode I listened to today on Gladiator. They took the music of Hans Zimmer and they said, okay, Hans Zimmer loves the key of D minor. They took like 30 second snippets from like eight films and they put it into one song. And it was like, it's the same song. <laughs> now it was varied. Like there were like little, little bit of themes that were different, but it, like it all felt like it could have flowed right into the, to, to each other. And so I love stuff like that, how they, they just kind of make all these connections. I will say, I really enjoyed how the way they deconstructed these pieces and, yeah. and, and they 
certainly they made me hear things that I had never heard before. The one that stood out to me was, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the name of the guys. Who's the guy on the podcast that plays the piano? <laughs> I don't. I don't okay. know. I'll just call him Aussie 1, Aussie 2, Aussie 3. I don't, I don't I think, know. I think it was Aussie 2 plays the piano. Yeah. And and it's really he's, cool he's because. He's really good. He's very, really good. very yeah, good. Yeah, and, he, and he really deconstructs this stuff for them. And you can really get in, dig into it. Yeah. And one of the things he did was I had never thought like, he was talking about the gospel influences on the main Jurassic Park theme. The da 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 Now, well, I've known that song. It's, that song is part of my DNA. I've never heard gospel in that. Me but, either, he's, yeah. but he gets down on the piano and he starts playing the chords for that theme. And then he starts playing Lean On Me. And I think, you know, when we go down this religious aspect, um, I see, I don't know if anyone else hears this, I hear like gospel influences. Like, tell me if this, this is another famous gospel song. You're mashing them up. You're mashing oh, yeah, them up yeah, live. I'm butchering this, but um, I'm <laughs> sure right. John Williams did not have that in that in his brain. Hmm. Uh, but I, I, I hear a huge resemblance to Lean On Me for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're doing similar things. I can see yeah, that. Yeah, they are. I would have never, ever in a million years thought of that or picked that up. And that I really yeah. enjoyed that. So this podcast, they do go into other composers. So, for example, you mentioned Jurassic Park being a really influential soundtrack. I grew up loving Dances with Wolves. We've talked about this film before. Well, that movie soundtrack was probably second only to Star Wars for me. So uh, Dances with Wolves, uh, the, the score by John Barry. Just love it. So they go into that. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever seen the movie Arrival? You ever seen that movie? It's another sci-fi film with Amy Adams. Oh, uh, I, no, I've not seen it, but I know the one you're talking about. The soundtrack for it is incredibly unique and it's about aliens and there are moments in the films where we're hearing noises from the aliens and they go into these the the, the podcasters how the film and the soundtrack are kind of like playing off each other and it's just really really unique uh, so johan johansson is the the composer for that film and there's things that these guys do in this podcast that are just like unpack the film in ways that you just never would have expected do you know who johnny greenwood is you ever heard of him as a composer johnny greenwood that's that it doesn't ring a bell he's the lead guitarist for radiohead he's become a film composer and so he does most of the films for paul thomas anderson so like there will be blood and uh, i'm trying to think you probably have heard of boogie nights kind of like these you know artsy films a little bit independent films well you know so they go into the there will be blood soundtrack so there's just all kinds of amazing things lastly i'll say this one of the things that they get into is like what is popular these days or what is the accepted what what is the trends for for film soundtracks and it's almost like these guys aren't this way by the way but if you're into this realm you have to either be a williams guy or a han zimmer guy you know and so which one are you going to be which camp are you going to come down on williams in many ways has become out of fashion he is a he is a true classic almost like he fits really well into the classic Hollywood era using orchestras, coming up with themes for each character. Hans Zimmer uses a lot of technology and a lot of his scores are more about mood, setting a mood, uh, ambient sounds. And I'll be honest, I, I, I'm not a huge Hans Zimmer fan. Uh, I really like his score for the film Dune which came out, uh, what is it, a couple of years ago now. And I really like that. But, you know, there are some elements of Hans Zimmer's scores that I just don't like. But they did go through Gladiator. And, and you know, going through the, the scores, then I go, yep, this is brilliant. It's amazing. And so I just appreciate what they do. No, I think it's interesting, like, what you're saying about John Williams kind of fitting into that kind of classic model of of, of hollywood um uh, because uh, art of the score the episode i was listening to uh, they were drawing comparisons uh, to uh, music from the film vertigo which i think was was it bernard herman who did yes, the, I, yeah <laughs> yeah um, they talk about herman a lot actually okay he comes up because williams williams was influenced by him 
Yeah, and they they were playing snippets together of n- not necessarily taking things directly and copying it, but just sh- maybe just a couple notes here or there and uh, connecting things like with these like little threads that you know were very Hermanesque. Yeah, yeah, that's what's amazing about what these guys do in their podcast is they have this encyclopedic knowledge. They they often actually they do concerts. I believe I think m- many of them, or if not all of them, are from Melbourne. Australia so they're they're leading orchestras and they'll do I think they do some of these really cool performances have you ever heard of this where they'll play Harry Potter or they'll play Indiana Jones and then the orchestra will play along with them live have you ever heard about these performances so you yeah. mean when when they when they'll play the film on a screen and the orchestra will play along yep the whole thing and they'll play for the whole the, the, the duration of the whole film yeah I was just looking at one of them that was coming to Orlando I can't remember I think it was a Star Wars film um I don't remember what it was but it sounded really interesting to me you know another thing you just mentioned Harry Potter I gotta tell you I I never saw those movies until last year okay. I didn't I had no idea John Williams had written those scores until we watched them yeah he did one two three I believe which are brilliant they are oh they were were wonderful his his one i would argue his one for the third is probably the best um and yeah really really amazing well so let me say this i'll I'll wrap this up here uh one little snippet that i think is really interesting in terms of film history there's another side video and there's lots of other like this this just gets you lost into like a whole other realm but there's this musical theme and it's another light motif called uh the dies irae you ever heard this before about the dearest irae i think i heard them talking about it they probably talked about it <laughs> i'm pretty sure that i i learned that term today it is the death theme that in many films they will bring it up when somebody's going to die or somebody's about to die or they're thinking about death and so the the, the, the notes go bum 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 Bum, 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 bum. And it's been used by like hundreds of composers, right? It's just everywhere. It's yeah. in The Shining. This is one that, that Dan reminded me about, um, mm. the opening of The Shining. Oh, don't don't lie, Andrew. That was you playing the tuba in grade seven, wasn't it? Come on, I've heard that recording before. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that's the first that's the first mm. cue, isn't it? In the yeah, in the it whole is. Movie. Yeah, and it's an electronic reorchestration of it, I think. So yeah, yeah. There you go. It's it's just stuff like that where you get lost in it, and it's just amazing, right? Yeah. So not so then you kind of know what you're listening for more. So you're you're kind of educating yourself. The funny thing about our rabbit trails, our rabbit holes, is it's like this could be my life now, Joe. It's like. <laughs> I could just listen to these 20 CDs for the end of my days. And that, I don't know that I'm ever going to get to all this. And and, and the, the fun thing about rabbit holes is that they can become overwhelming. And it's like, wow, I've only scratched the surface of John Williams when it, when it really comes to it. I was thinking about this and I, I have a feeling what we're going to find out from these segments, these rabbit hole episodes, is that I'm not sure that either of us have the attention span to dedicate the rest of our life to any one thing. And that, know. you know, you will absolutely be obsessed with John Williams until the next thing that you're obsessed with. There you go. There you go. Oh, hey, speaking of, I have one last question for you. This is going to be, a, this is the curveball. Mm. Honest question. Honest question for you. We're getting older. We're in our middle ages. What would you say is the last new artist that you came across a music artist that you have actually become a fan of that you've actually said oh man i love this person as opposed to john williams we grew up with him billy joel right we can't i'm not talking like a new billy joel album which doesn't exist i'm talking about a more recent artist putting out music it doesn't have to be i'm not talking about harry styles or billy eilish here but is is there anybody I, i have one person in mind that i wanted to bring up but i was curious you and I have recently been talking like we're just listening to old music, aren't we? We're listening to the stuff that's comforting to us. Has there been any artist that you go, you know what? This is this is some new music that I'm actually really liking. Who would be the last one? Who would who would who would be the last one that would fall on that list for now, me? Now, are are we talking about like where I totally got obsessed with their music and dove in, or I just had a very healthy appreciation? For their music because I would I- say you you have to make some kind of commitment where you go, you know what, I am a this fill in the blank person now where I, I could I could call myself one of those their fans. 
Hmm, that is a great, great question. And I actually kind of, the, the thing about it is I wish you would give me this question in advance because <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I, I need to think about this because I've certainly listened to a lot of new yeah. music, you know, over the last, you know, decade. But I don't know if there's anybody that I've invested in their music. Like, I mean, I, you know, like Taylor Swift comes to mind and I listened to Taylor Swift's new album this week. There you go. That might be a person, yeah. I, I enjoyed it, and I I like Taylor Swift's music. I really liked uh, the album Folklore, um, but like I don't go out of my way to buy her music. I I didn't try to buy tickets. That, I guess it's a good thing I didn't try, try to buy tickets for uh, her tour uh, next year because uh, I don't think I would have got them. But <laughs> I, I I don't know. I don't know that there's anybody who I'm really a big fan of i've become a fan of older music that i didn't give a big chance to the first time around uh, or that music is before my time but i i i I was in asking that question i was wondering if if i should count that as well so like like so so nirvana i mean nirvana is one that where i've started buying nirvana albums and really getting into nirvana 30 years later yeah, um, you I, I, you know, a band that I hated the first, you know, when they came out, but you know, now I've I've developed an appreciation for their music over the years. Uh, but there's a nostalgia attached to that as well. I think, yeah, I think so. Maybe I think I am asking the question: Have you become a fan? Some, you know, even just semi, you know, devoted to somebody actually doing music now? Because I think there's also like a natural aversion, unless we know the artist. We're starting to get to that place where you're like, ah, you know, it's not for me. I don't want to, I, I don't even care. But I, I have an initial, an immediate turnoff to newer, younger artists just because, just because it's like, it's not what I'm used to. Get off so, my lawn. That, get off my lawn. What are you doing here? You'll never be as good as the old stuff. Um, I did want to mention maybe two artists that, uh, that I wanted to mention. One is I've really gotten into the music of Paramore and, uh, and Haley Williams, uh, her music. I just think they're amazing. It's funny. I was driving around yesterday listening to Taylor Swift's new album and Paramore. Yeah, and, what'd you think? Well, I thought they were both great. But again, at this point in my life, I don't think I'm ready to commit to either of them. <laughs> Fair enough. We have to set up boundaries. I, I just, you know, I mean, like, I, am I going to go out and buying their records and go seeing them on tour? Am I going to buy merch? No, nah, I'm, I'm not. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> now, the other one, and this was a recommendation. I never would have heard of this artist. A friend of the podcast, uh, Nate Eichelman. I was uh, on a trip. Actually, I was on a trip for this album that you and I assisted uh, in producing uh, for Rich Mullins. But I was I was at his house staying there uh, for a couple of days. And he said, you got you to gotta check out this guy. His name is Nick Lutzko. And I thought, sure. You know, who? I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. And that he started to, he just played me a bunch of YouTube clips of this guy's music. And it was just what what's fun about new music is when somebody's doing something different that you've just like, I've never it, it's like that that moment when you first were introduced to Weird Al. You're like, what is this? Like, what is going on? <laughs> and and so this guy, he writes his own satirical music. They're not parodies, uh, but there's this one song that I love called school board meeting and it's like a parody it's a satire of this guy just going to school board meetings and yelling about whatever makes him angry and and, and just this guy's delivery nick let's go his delivery the way that he embodies the lyrics his performance i'm only happy when i'm screaming at my old It's just like I'm sold. Like I'm a fan now. I'm a fan of this guy, Nick Letzko. Um, he also is famous. Probably what he's most known for is he kind of wrote a new theme song for the Spirit Halloween stores. Do you have Spirit Halloweens in Florida? Oh, I, everybody has them, right? I mean, they're like everywhere. I think <laughs> we, we all. Everybody wonders this. Like you know, there's like at least two in my area every year, and we all we all like is there, are they everywhere? So it's good to know that they're everywhere. We always had them in Jersey. Okay, there you go. He wrote a trio of songs, kind of as an homage, but also making fun of, but also lovingly making fun of Spirit Halloween. I had a dream about Spirit Halloween. They called me up and 
said they need a new theme song. One thousand dollars for one hundred retweets. I said okay. They said sweet, so this is the theme for Spirit Halloween. They got ghouls and new locations on every single street, saving the global economy. And uh, anyway, I just love this guy, and I guess at my age. I'm just astounded when something reaches me that I that it is it is good enough. I am engrossed with it enough that I'm like, yeah, I can be on board as a fan of this guy. I'm probably planning to buy one of his uh, his uh, albums on vinyl for Christmas for myself, depending on if uh, whatever makes the list. And I'll probably get a Paramore <laughs> album as well. I, I love I love their stuff. So I was just curious if you had anything like that in your own realm. No, I don't really think so. I mean, I, I think I'm just at this point in my life where I'm just diving full into my, you know, grumpy old man period. I, yeah. You know, I, I, I <laughs> like, I, I still have like a dozen Tom Petty records I still need to buy, and a dozen Bruce Springsteen albums I need to buy, and I, you know, and you know, like, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I've got like, you know, 50 <laughs> years of rock and roll to catch up on. As you know, my son's generation is going to have to, you know pick up the slack and buy all this new stuff i just heard it announced that bob dylan is going to be re releasing a bootleg series for the time out of mind oh, sessions really and what i think was funny about it it was like a five cd set so what, what's so funny about it is it's like who has time for all this stuff right like we're not even getting into the stuff we actually like anymore we just we have five cds of time out of mind demo sessions to, to per peruse through you know it's like Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Dylan can do what he wants, right? But um, it's just funny. <laughs> Dylan is Dylan. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you haven't got his book yet, have you? No, I, I hope to get it for Christmas. I have all that. That's the thing. That's another rabbit hole is, you know, music biographies, autobiography, music memoirs. I want to get Bono's book, Dylan's book. I, I was in uh, Target uh, the other day and I was holding Dylan's book in my hand. and I, or, oh. or Bono's book. No, well, I was holding Dylan's. Though Bono's book okay. was right next to it on the oh, shelf. Okay. It was okay. right. It was right next to it on the shelf. But I was holding Dylan's book, and I was just, oh, uh, no, no, no. You're gonna buy it. You're gonna bring it home, and you're not gonna read it for six months. So I put it back. Uh, you know, we'll save that thirty dollars for something else right now. But I really want that book. You have so much self control. I applaud you. I applaud <laughs> you. Um, I will say this last thing. My favorite living composer, other than John Williams is a man named Steve Reich. It looks like Steve Reich. And for my birthday, I gifted myself with an audiobook of a book that he did. Uh, it's called Conversations. And he's just talking to other composers. Like he talks to Brian Eno. He talks to Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead. He's talking, and it, it's, that's another rabbit hole. I would count that as the same rabbit hole. I've, I've kind of been in this classical music, soundtracks, that, that's where I've been the last few months with my music. And um, if, if anybody's ever listened to Steve Reich, he is like, he changed my life. Steve Reich also changed my life. It's quite amazing, uh, his music. and uh, But it's also very different than John Williams. So anyway, it's been a good few months. As, as hard as life has been for me, I've had a good few months, Joe. You know, I was thinking about it and I was trying to think, well, I was listening to Taylor Swift's new record this week. And I'm thinking, I, would I have listened to it? if Bruce Springsteen hadn't said how great an album it was, you know. Okay. He, he so did that, huh? He, he did, did, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, he, but he also said that he only heard it because his daughter made him listen to it. <laughs> so. Well, you know, you know, the review that I heard was Taylor Swift made a great Churches album. Do you know the band Churches? Hmm. I'm trying to think. They're, they're, they're like an electropop Scottish band. So my wife is like, Abby is much hipper than i am i because she would never use the word hip for one and uh and two uh she listens to a lot of new stuff so i was trying to think if that was one of her artists but <laughs> but but she she loves taylor swift's new album um there you go there she's you go. Re yeah really into it and and she really likes paramore too by the way um <laughs> i see uh, you're saying i'm pretty hip i, I can see that so you're you're one hip dude man <laughs> uh you're a hip cat but oh yeah no i i uh <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, I, I hear it and I go, like, this is really good. Like, I, mm. but I'm a little more of a mellow kind of dude. Like, so I, I preferred Taylor's Folklore album because it was more kind of folksy. And I thought the writing was a little more mature. I was listening to the new one and she's talking about how, like, karma is my boyfriend. And I just thought that was the dumbest lyric. Like, <laughs> just like i don't know like there's something about like that when she goes uh, like a little too pop it doesn't quite 
yeah. connect with me on the lyrical level, but like the production is like, I mean, the production's fire, you know, it's. Have you ever heard of uh, Madison Cunningham? You ever heard of her? She's brilliant. She's great. Have you ever heard of Phoebe Bridgers? I have. Yeah. Right. I think you would see, see, I, I you know, there's, there's so much out there, Joe. There's so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm saying like, if, if I had nothing else to do but just sit and listen to music all day, every day for the rest of my life, then I would probably, you know, get bored of all the same stuff that I like. Problem is, when I have time to listen to music, I just want to grab something off the shelf that I like, there you know, go. that I already yeah. know I like, uh, or an artist I know I'm going to enjoy. Maybe it's an Elton John album I've never heard before, yeah. because... God knows Elton's got like 60 albums or something. And it's like, <laughs> I, and I love Elton John, but I've never listened to all of his records. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so there's so many artists I love and respect whose music I haven't fully dove into. And I'll just never have the time to do it. And yeah. that sucks. But because of that, the new artists, they're just down. They're just, they're way, way back on, on my, uh, my list, you know, uh, of things to get to. So, you know, maybe someday, maybe someday, if I, if I live to be like 120. Yeah. When I'm 80 years old, I'll write a review on how great I think Billie Eilish is, you know, second There you go. Was. There you go. What you're saying is, is I've told you about the rabbit hole and I come back and you've got a shovel and you're filling in the dirt on the holes. <laughs> you're like, you're like. <laughs> I'm burying the rabbit. You're it's... burying. Yeah. You're like, what are you doing? No, I told you to listen to that. And that's fine. That's fine. Right. What, what can we do? We, we only have so much time. So we would love to hear from you. What are your own rabbit holes? What have you been getting into? Maybe spending a little more time than you would, you would have normally. Uh, you know, even if it's just a Netflix binge, you know, you're just sitting there watching a whole bunch of episodes of a show. We'd love to hear it. We'd love to hear from you. So speaking of that, we have a couple of letters in our listener mailbag. Chris, uh, this first one comes in from our friend Nate Eichelman, and uh, he just sent us a message. This was uh, from in regard to our horror movie. Uh, in fact, both of these messages came in for about our horror movie episode. Uh, if people haven't listened to it yet, go back. I highly recommend you know getting to hear you know two uh, sheltered uh, guys talk about seeing a slasher movie for the first time ever. It's uh, it's quite sad, actually. <laughs> Jer, I'm I'm terrified what this letter is going to say, Joe. Nate, what 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 could he possibly have told us? I'm terrified. No, no, it starts off good. Great podcast, fellas. There you okay, go. Okay, good. He said, finally finished it. He goes, I am much older than you, Joe, but V absolutely traumatized me. You remember what V is, Chris? We is that the one where the aliens pull off their faces? Yeah, that was a, a mini series in the early '80s that we we. we touched on this briefly how how v traumatized me when i was like four years old yeah, anyway he said v absolutely traumatized me seriously when they peeled their skin off i had nightmares about it uh went back to watch it recently and wow it was cheesy yeah i don't i I, I, I don't doubt that nate i I'm, I'm sure that you know i was you know i'm sure the special effects looked great in 1984 or three or whatever it was but yeah right I'm sure that was terrible. The other was from uh, Dina McClure. You, you you met Dina recently, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. On that same trip down to when I was visiting with Nate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dina's been a family friend of ours for years now, and she's been a loyal listener to the podcast. So thank you, Dina. And she just uh, sent a quick message to say, okay, that was a great spooky episode, but The Shining is still the classic. We didn't talk about The Shining, did we? <laughs> no, we didn't. I, I that's another one I watched as an adult. I now mean, you're 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 a big Kubrick fan, right? Huge, huge Stanley Kubrick fan. I've never seen The Shining, Chris. It's worth it, man. It'll mess you up inside. <laughs> All right, is that on HBO Max? Can I, I go on? I tonight think it is watch? on HBO. Yeah, I think you could. It All right, mess, it is a that is a movie. Let me tell you that. I mean, it makes you not want to be alone. Is what I mean. It's. <laughs> And it's also about like the 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 horrors of the of the human soul, like what's going on inside of us. So yeah, it's definitely worth watching. That's another one where the only thing I know about it, like I, I everything I know about The Shining, I learned from The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. 
That's right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> was it uh, all, all work and no play makes Jack a dull yeah, boy? What, it, did, what did they say? In no season? beer and no. Uh, I can't remember the line. But yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. I yeah, that. make, yeah, make yeah. Homer go crazy. I know that. Make Homer go crazy. There you go. Yep. There you go. Yeah, you need to get the real version. Actually, there are numerous Simpsons spoofs of The Shining. Like they, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing. You know, it's a little bit of a, a light motif. You might say. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dina and Nate. If anybody else wants to uh, reach out to us and, and comment on a past episode or this episode right here, uh, reach out to us. You can uh, get us on all the social media sites. We're uh, Nostalgic Future Podcast on Facebook and Instagram and on YouTube. We're also on Twitter at at Past Future Pod. And you can email us at Nostalgic Future Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Nostalgic Future Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line at nostalgicfuturepodcast at gmail.com. We may just read your letter on an upcoming show. Follow us on social media, Nostalgic Future Podcast on Facebook and at Past Future Pod on Twitter. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a review to help support what we do. Until next time, remember, the past is the only way forward. got out of the house and came downtown for a little culture? <laughs> They're butchering the classics. Could that bassoon have come in any more late? Oh, come on, Homer. There's lasers. You like lasers. Laser effects, mirrored balls. John Williams must be rolling around in his grave. <laughs> Deliciously satirical. I wonder if anyone else got that. We're out of here. <laughs>